Hey everybody, it's Carmine again, and I'm here with another Let's Play. We're going to be playing Baldur's Gate, the advanced, the advanced Dungeons and Dragons setting. Er, well, second edition D&D, I should say. We'll be playing the enhanced edition, as you can see here. Let's go ahead and get in there and make a new character. New game. For those curious, Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition is basically the Baldur's Gate 2 engine on ba in Baldur's Gate 1. Let's see, gender. Uh, I'm just going to be a dude. Screw it. Let's see. Now, where's that one face I like to... Whoa. Some of these are very special individuals. Where's that one face I like to use? There it is. Nice. Now, if you're new to D&D, especially 2nd Edition in particular, all of these are these races, Elf, Half-Elf, Gnome, Halfling, Dwarf, and Half-Orc, have their own racial benefits. For instance, uh, Elves are faster and uh, less hardy than humans, resulting in a bonus to Dex and a penalty to Con. They also have a bunch of really nice effects over humans, like being almost immune to charm and sleep spells, being able to see in the dark, and having a bonus to hit with swords, short swords, and long swords, or bows, sorry. They have a, Now, if you've never played D&D or 2nd Edition, you're probably wondering what the hell this is. This is THACO, which is an acronym. Two hit, armor class, zero. We'll get into that later. Humans... Humans' only benefits are they have slightly better thieving skills. However, humans have one very unique advantage. They may advance as any class and are the only race that can dual class. Humans can't multi-class. What that means, that's a little unusual, advances any class. In second edition, there were hard caps on how high a character's level could be based upon their race. Uh, elves could only progress, I think, to level 15 as a fighter, for instance, whereas a human's progression is unbound. This seldom comes into play, though, because, uh... We're, going, we're only going to pick human for uh, one particular class that I'm going to be playing, because it, only humans can be paladins, and by extension, another problem. Half-elves are what happened when a human and an elf love each other very much. Uh, they receive a 30% resistance to charm and sleep spells, and have infravision. They receive bonuses to, the, to these thieving skills. Gnomes. These are not your WoW gnomes. Well, they still make gunpowder and blow things up, so perhaps there's more there and com there's more there than together than I thought. Gnomes fall into the dwarven family, so they receive a bonus on saving throws. Again, probably a new term if you've never played any D and D. Saving throws in particular versus rod, staff, wand, and versus spell, with an additional bonus based on constitution. The hardier a gnome is, the harder it is to affect them with magic. They have Infravision. They receive a bonus to Intelligence and a penalty to Wisdom, making them very good mages. The problem being they can only be one type, one kind of mage, and that's an Illusionist. Halflings. Well, everybody knows Halflings. This is the, basically your uh, Lord of the Ring Hobbit. Lord of the Rings, sorry, Hobbit. They receive a to hit bonus with Slings. They receive a bonus to Dexterity, a penalty to Strength, a penalty to Wisdom, and a bonus on saving throws versus Paralysis, Poison, and Death, which would be very common this early on, versus Rod, Staff, Wand, and versus Spell. This is essentially every saving throw in the game. Dwarves receive them against everything. Gnomes do not receive them against Paralysis, Poison, and Death. Let's see. Dwarves have Infravision. They have a bonus to Thieving Skills. They, may, they are the only race that can be Dwarven Defenders which is a dwarf who is specialized in tunnel fighting and, uh, in general, very good at taking punishment. They have a bonus to constitution, a penalty to dexterity, and a sizable penalty to charisma. Half-orc. Half-orcs have a bonus to strength and con and a sizable penalty to, to intelligence. They make excellent barbarians, though, and fighters. Now, we're going to be playing a human because human is the only class, the only race allowed to play every class, including paladin. Now, basically, your class determines everything at your outset in 2nd edition, and unlike in 3rd edition D&D, you can't change between classes. Once you pick a class, you progress through it forever, unless you're a human. In which case, one time in the game, you may change your class. Only once and you will lose access to your previous class features until you gain a level in your new class. To get around this, 
ra the non-human races may multi-class, which is, they progress in two classes at the same time. By and large, they're almost always better than simply progressing in a single class. We're going to be looking over these. Classes also have something called kits. And a kit is a set of special abilities that follows an archetype and sets you apart from other fighters, for instance, or wizards, or clerics. For instance, a fighter could be a fighter, or they could be a berserker, or a wizard slayer, or a kinsai. Or if they were a dwarf, they could be a dwarven defender. Now here's the thing. If you're multi-classing, you may not multi-class into a kit and a kit. You may only multi-class between classes. But for what we're doing, I'm going to be playing a paladin, a special type of paladin that was added in the Enhanced Edition. While ordinarily I'd be uh, some paragon of justice and virtue, I'm going to be playing a blackguard this time. Uh, blackguards are the exact opposite of paladins. They are not the knight in shining armor. They're the one of the some of the cruelest bastards you'll ever meet. They're the quintessential black knight. Uh, as an as advantages, I'm immune to level drain and fear effects. I may turn undead as a paladin of the same level. I may use the absorb health ability once per day. Absorb health deals two points of damage per level to an enemy, healing the blackguard for the same number of hit points. I may use the poison weapon ability once per day. Gains one use at level 1 and one use at level 5, and additionally use every 5 levels thereafter. So level 1, level 5, and level 10. Poison weapon is very nasty in the early game. Poison in general is very nasty at low levels in D&D. Each successful hit within the next round will inject poison into the target, dealing an extra 2 points of damage per second. A round consists of 6 seconds, so that's 12 damage per round. That per round, and uh, if the target fails a saving throw versus poison, they suffer an extra point of damage per round for four rounds. Uh, third level, I gain the Aura of Despair ability, which basically, I'm an intimidating asshole, and I can cause people to become demoralized, basically. We won't see anything above sixth level because Baldur's Gate caps out at ten. The disadvantages. Alignment restricted to evil. May not cast detect evil. May not cast protection from evil as an innate ability. May not use the lay on hands ability. Lay on hands, for those wondering, allows a paladin to heal their target for two hit points per level of the paladin. I don't have protection from evil, which is really useful at this level. Um, I do get a bonus to all saving throws, which is quite nice. So there we go. Now, alignment. There's nine alignments, differing between law and chaos, Good and evil. In this case, I'm going to go over go with neutral evil. The neutral evil characters have no qualms with betraying their friends or companions for personal gain, and typically base their allegiance on power and money, which makes them quite receptive to bribes. An unscrupulous mercenary, a common thief, and a double-crossing informer who betrays people to the authorities to protect and advance himself are typical examples of neutral evil characters. I will be playing a bit of a the uh I'm looking out for number one, but... type. So, let's get that done. Abilities. Now here's the fun part. I'm going to be rolling for a while. Because ideally, I'm going to want to get a score in, uh... I want to get a total roll down here around 90-ish. This is a lot easier as a black guard because I have a minimum charisma score. Now, if we were playing tabletop 2nd edition D&D, I'd be rolling three six-sided dice to determine these scores, and I wouldn't have the luxury of minimums. Paladins in 2nd edition were pretty rare, because you needed really good stats to play one. You need a minimum of 12 strength, a minimum of 14 constitution, and a minimum of 14 charisma. And the number of re-rolls you got were at the, oh, the mercy of your GM, hello. We're going to store that, that's pretty close to what I want. 1847 is not very high, though. Being a fighter, I am entitled a, or falling into the fighter class. I am uh, entitled to, to roll for something called exceptional strength. So, exceptional strength is basically a percentage of another point of strength. Some people are really freaking strong in this setting. And once you go above about 1850, you start seeing sizable, sizable benefits to uh, hit and damage. Now, we're going to re-roll. If we can't come up with anything better, well, I don't know what we're going to do. 87 is not a bad score. Let's see what it's got in the strength department. 
1868, not bad. I'm... I don't know. Not take, not keeping that one. Um, I'm probably going to be here for a little bit, so I will be rolling for a while, and, and I will come back to you when I have a character that's probably going to survive the low-level game. Um, never mind, I just got... I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, because 1899 is the closest I'm going to get when it comes to strength. Intelligence of 9, that is not really deficient in anything, but I'm not no grand thinker. Charisma 18, I need wisdom higher though. Oh man, tough call here. My dexterity does not need to be obscenely high, and since 14 does not give you any benefit, I see no reason to have it higher. Wisdom determines how many spells I can cast. Charisma doesn't do anything but make me more interesting to people. So we're going to bump Wisdom to 13. Wisdom influences some saving throws. 1899 is just short of perfect for my, for my purposes. So we're going to take that. Now we go into skills. These are less skills and more feats, basically. This is the ability to fight with weapons. Now, depending on how many proficiency points I put into a, uh, a weapon, I will do better or worse. We're going to take the two-handed sword. Uh, we're going to take the longbow. And we're going to take the two-handed weapon style. This is, uh, so what these do, the one-point and two-handed weapon style allows me to hit, I have a plus one to bonus to damage rolls when I'm wielding a two-handed weapon. I score critical hits on 19 or 20 when wielding a two-handed weapon. And I swing faster, a minus two bonus to speed factor. We'll get into speed factor later. Proficient means I can use a weapon with no penalties, and being specialized in the two-handed sword, I receive an extra plus one to hit and plus two to damage, and since I'm a warrior, half an attack per round with the selected weapon. We'll get into that in a bit. My proficiencies are distributed. My appearance, I don't particularly care about. Let's listen to these voices here. Death to you all! Angsty basement dweller. Slightly less angsty basement dweller. <laughs> Time for a bit of the rough and tumble. Horrible ac horribly accented voice actor. You got this coming! This one has some promise. Let's give them a right thrashing. James Bond? Get over here. No, I'd really rather not. You got this coming! Yeah, I think that sounds like me. And now for the name. All right, we're done. Let's go ahead and accept. Well, actually, no, we'll accept in the next episode because there's more than uh, two minutes worth of text coming our way and dialogue. So, I'm going to go ahead and cut it here, and I'll see everybody back for the next installment of Baldur's Gate.